Let me walk over here to the right side of the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Um, it's an honor to be back here. I know I've been here about five or six times in a row. I know you've only done this seven times, but uh, I've been a regular here uh, because I believe so much in what the NRA stands for. And I, I want to thank them for asking me to come back. I want to thank, in particular, Chris and Wayne. Uh, Chris is a dear friend and uh, someone who's uh, gone along a, a little bit of the journey with his family that we did in ours. I just did a little book signing out back, and many of you came by, and I just want to thank you all so much. I wrote this book about, with my wife, Karen, about our daughter, Bella. You may recall during the campaign, we suspended the campaign back in 2012 uh, because our daughter, who has a very severe birth defect called trisomy 18, got deathly ill, and we had to suspend the campaign. Uh, and people got to know who she was, but we didn't really feel like she, they, that people really knew her. They just knew that she had gotten sick. And uh, we decided to write this book and, and tell, her, tell her story to the nation about how this little girl who can't talk or walk, can't feed herself, can do almost nothing in the eyes of the world, has been such an amazing blessing to our family. And I wanted to share just one story from that because it, it, I, I share that because I think it's important at this time when we're not feeling real good about the way things are going here at home, particularly our government and our leadership in this country. We're worried and concerned rightfully about what's happening around the world and its impact on our security and our economy. I want to share with you just a story about how we still need and should have faith because we are still a country, we are still a country that is deeply, deeply committed to the values and morals that made our country great and the faith that made our country great. That day that my, we checked into the hospital and we, I had to call and talk, tell my staff to suspend the campaign. You're running for president. We had just been announced the winner of Iowa a few days before. So we had a little bit of momentum, even though it was two weeks after the Iowa caucuses. And I had to suspend the campaign because my daughter was deathly ill. We could barely keep her breathing. Her heart rate was 200. We ended up going to the hospital. and. I said, just announce that I don't want to make my little girl with a disability an issue in the race. So I just said, let's just announce that I'm suspending. They said, oh, you can't do that because everyone will think you're quitting. And he said, plus, don't you want people to pray for her? And I said, yeah, I do. And so we announced just that. Please pray for our daughter, Bella. When we went into the emergency room, they took an x-ray of her chest. This is a little girl who can't cough very well because her muscle tone's really low and can't swallow very well, can't do a whole lot of things that, well, each of us can do just to survive. And she, they took this x-ray and her lungs were completely full of fluid. They said she had pneumonia, very severe. And so we immediately put her in the in emergency unit and, and, and sat there and sat watch on her. As the day went on into the night, usually at kids at night, they get worse, but she didn't. We just sat and prayed, and we felt the prayers of a nation. The next morning, they came in, and this little girl, again, who has chronic lung disease, they took an x-ray, and her lungs were perfectly clear. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to share with you that we are at a time in America where we need people to be committed to understand that this country is in great jeopardy. I heard other speakers come out and talk about this issue, and it's probably the most important issue that we're dealing with right now, and that's the issue of freedom. Freedom is under assault not by the gay and lesbian community, no. It's under assault by the left in America, just like it's been under the assault of the Second Amendment, it's been an assault by the left, just like every other freedom that we have. Government is trying to determine and tell you how you're supposed to run your life, what you're supposed to believe now. They're not looking for tolerance. They're looking for conformity. They're looking for you to go along with what they believe, and they are not going to be tolerant of any dissent. This is what this fight is all about. It's a fight about freedom, 
I always say the Second Amendment is there to protect the First Amendment. The Second Amendment is there to protect our freedoms, not just our own personal freedoms. I have my own concealed carry card that I have in my home state, and I'm very proud of that, as does my wife. I always tell you that I want to tell you what kind of wife I have for, for uh, her birthday's coming up in a couple of weeks. She doesn't want flowers. She wants ammo. So, <laughs> and I never buy enough. So I, I can tell you, we're, we're committed on the Second Amendment, A-plus rating, all the things we work closely with the NRA, and those are important issues and ones that we need to be vigilant on, particularly as the left continues. But they're coming at a different assault here. They're coming at our foundation. You know, there's, one, there's a great speaker by the name of Oz Guinness who talks about the iron triangle of freedom that has sustained America. And this is how it works. Freedom requires virtue. You think about it, that makes sort of good sense. The less virtuous we are as a society, the less free we will be. The less well-behaved we are, the more the government will come in and try to impose its will to control bad behavior. We see it all the time. Anybody like going through airports these days? Every time we as a society move down that road further to unvirtuous behavior, government finds a reason to come in and control. So freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. What is the greatest teacher of virtue in America and in the world? It's the Bible. It's the moral code that comes from faith. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. Faith requires freedom. And what is an assault today is the freedom to exercise your faith. I got a question at CPAC the other day, the Conservative Political Action Conference from a conservative moderator. And you know what their question was to me? Senator, are you too religious to be elected president of the United States? Can you imagine that question even being, being thought of 25 years ago? But ladies and gentlemen, there is an assault on faith, which is an assault ultimately on the freedom to believe, and it is the, it is the trunk from which all other rights flow. If you don't have the right to believe what you want to believe, then all the other rights we have are pretty hollow. What are you defending? What are you defending if you can't be who you are and exercise that and be that out, not just in your church, but in your community, in the public square, in your business, in your school. How did we get this way? How did this happen? People all me ask, how did it happen? I always tell this story about a guy named G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton was a reformer, a social crusader and reformer during the turn of the last century in London. After Victorian England, the elites of London and England went very, very far to a licentious world, and he was fighting back against that. And so one of these rags, these liberal rags, asked him to write an article. And the article was entitled, they wanted him to write, was, What's Wrong with the World? And he said, okay, I'll do it. They were poking fun at him. They thought they'd make fun of his article. And he submitted this article. What's wrong with the world? I am, respectfully submitted, G.K. Chesterton. Ladies and gentlemen, as much as I'd like to come here and engage you to applaud, I need to engage you in an effort to help change our country. If you think that just this room, think, look at the people in this room, the folks who are driving the agenda on the other side don't even come near to the size of this room. But they are committed. Why is the NRA so successful in fighting back? Why are you so successful? Because they're committed. They wake up every day, just like they do here at the NRA. They wake up every day, and they are vigilant. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our country needs you. Our country needs that vigilance. People ask me all the time, Senator, what can I do? And the answer is always the same, no matter who it is. Do something. Do something in your school. Do you know the most popular textbook that's taught in our high schools in America is written by a man named Howard Zinn, who is a Marxist, anti-American Marxist, and that is the most common textbook. How many have that in your schools, and do you know? I was at a Junior States of America speech, a crowd not quite this big, but a, almost 2,000 kids, high school kids. And I asked them this question. So I wanted to know, you know what our best and brightest high school kids who were coming to this regional conference to be elected governor and state legislator and do model Congress. I said, put your head down, close your eyes. I have a question for you. Where do our rights come from? And let me give you a couple answers. You raise your hand when you get the right, we get the right one. Where do our rights come from? I said, first, the government. Raise your hand if they think they come from the government. About 20% of the hands went up. And then I said, our rights come from God. The room broke out in spontaneous laughter. They started pushing and shoving each other, pointing at me as if it was a joke. This is what our young people are learning. This is what the elites are doing to poison the minds of the future. How is that happening? Ladies and gentlemen, the answer is because we're letting it happen. Because we are not doing what the NRA does on the Second Amendment with the First Amendment, which is to be vigilant about the freedom that is the foundational freedom of our country, the freedom to believe what you want to believe and then live that out in your life. One of the great comments I heard from a man by the name of well, uh, Christopher Lash, who said, every day we get up and we tell ourselves lies so we can live. And the lie we tell ourselves as America is, yeah, America's changing, but what can I do? I'm only one person. I live in Tennessee, or I live in Arkansas, I live in Indiana. What can I do? You can fight. You can stand up, and you can fight. Ladies and gentlemen, Ronald Reagan gave a speech a little over a generation ago. And he ended that speech by saying, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And he went on to say that I don't want to be in my later years and to have to describe to my grandchildren what it was like to live in America where men once were free. I don't want to do it. People ask me, what, what are you out? Why am I here for my fifth or sixth time at the NRA convention? Why am I running around the country doing, doing speeches in Iowa yesterday, South Carolina tomorrow? I have seven children. I've got a little girl who every day is a blessing that she's alive. We were told she wouldn't live a few days. Every day is a blessing. Why? Because I'll be damned if I'm going to have this happen on my watch. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the uh, Iowa caucuses in 2012, I did 385 town hall meetings, all 99 counties. I had no money. I was someone who was not even, Fox News did a profile of the top 20 candidates for president in 2012, six months before the Iowa caucuses, and I wasn't even interviewed. And yet I went out there because I felt like I was called to go out and deliver a message, talk about freedom, talk about family, talk about opportunity. I went out and crossed the state of Iowa. 
People would say, why are you still running? Three weeks before the caucus, I was at 4 or 5% in the polls. I'd say, why are you still running? Everybody else has been to the top, and here you are, down at the bottom. Don't you get it? Nobody likes you. That's what reporters would tell me. They'd say, oh, they, nobody likes you. Well, I did 385 town hall meetings. Average attendance at those meetings, 12 people. 12. I, get, I spent $23,000 on television. You can't get elected dog catcher in most towns in America spending $23,000 on television. At the end of that time, just a day before the caucuses, I was at a church in Sioux City, Iowa, and I was giving a talk there. And the pastor, after the talk, walked up and gave me a little case. I opened it up, looked at it, looked like a cufflink case. I opened up, looked at it, and it was just two little round, looks like, I wasn't sure, maybe a coin or a, but it wasn't metal, and I couldn't really tell what it was, it was old, that's all I could tell, but it wasn't cufflinks. And so I opened up and looked at him, and, and I was just sort of hoping he would say, well, do you like the... <laughs> but he didn't. I said, thank you very much. He said, do you like them? I said, yeah, they're really nice, really nice. And I said, uh, what, what are they? He said, Senator, I saw you for the last several months travel all through this state and give it all. Nobody paid attention to you, everybody ignored you, and a lot of people made fun of you. You were ridiculed as, what are you doing here? But you committed yourself. You were willing to fight. You were willing to fight for our basic principles and tenets that made America great. And you were undeterred by everything. He said, these are widow's mites. These are the widow's mites from Jerusalem that I got when I was there a year ago. Just like the widow's mites that the women at the well put in and gave everything. And that the Lord blessed her with that. Ladies and gentlemen, today we need you. America, America needs you. To engage like you've never before. To have the passion. We have a chance in 2016. I know you hear this all the time because you've heard it the last time. Oh, if we engage, we're going to make a difference. And we've been disappointed by leaders in Congress who aren't leading, who aren't doing their job, who aren't standing up for truth, who aren't standing up against a president who's violating the Constitution almost on a daily basis. And I can understand why you can be frustrated, angry, and say, why bother anymore? But here's what I do know. Presidents can make a difference. Look at what Ronald Reagan did on day one. He took us country that was in malaise when Iran and Russia sound familiar, were in our face, making fun of us, holding hostages. We had canceled our attendance at the Olympics in, in, in Moscow. It was a disaster. We were weak. We were leading not even from behind. We weren't even close to being behind. And one election and one president made a difference. And so my call to you is in this year, find someone that you believe in. Find some, some, someone who holds your values. So, find someone who's going to go out and engage the fight and not back off because things get tough. And then maybe a year from now, a year and a half from now in November, someone will walk up to you and hand you a little box and say, you've earned these. You gave all. And what I do know when you give all, God will bless this nation and we will be free, strong, and prosperous again. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.